The passage we're going to be looking at is Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. And we're going to be looking at reflecting on growing as disciples of Christ Jesus. Allow me to read the passage for us. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be confirmed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Every follower of Jesus is invited to, is commanded to, and is also empowered to live a life of discipleship. Simply put, discipleship is a lifelong, lifelong process through which every one of us are being transformed more and more into the image and the likeness of Christ Jesus. Our discipleship is the most important part of our lives. You know, as we sung in the last song, when the race is complete, my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but Christ, Christ in me. Life is not just about what we make of it. Life is what God has designed it to be. And so all of our life is discipleship. All of our life is, is about each of us being transformed more and more into the image and the likeness of Jesus. And therefore, discipleship is not something that happens only in the walls of a, within the walls of a church. Discipleship spans across all of life. If you're a career professional, you're called to become more and more like Jesus in your career. If you're a homemaker or, or a young mom, you're called to become more and more like Jesus as a homemaker and as a young mom. If you're a student, you're called to become more and more like Jesus as a student. If you're a husband or a wife, in your marriage, you're called to become more and more like Jesus. If you're single, in your singleness, you're called to become more and more like Jesus. We are called to become more and more like Jesus in every season of our life and in every station of our life. So discipleship is not some part of our spiritual life in which we grow like Jesus. Discipleship is becoming more and more like Christ in all aspects, in all areas of our lives. This is what we mean when, when we use the phrase real disciples in a real world. A couple of weeks ago, we had a church retreat. Uh, all of us, most of us went away for about uh, uh, three days and we reflected on this theme, real disciples in a real world. We had Gunaraman, our speaker. He did a fabulous job of unpacking uh, the first few chapters of the book of Daniel on, on really reflecting on what does it mean to be real disciples in a real world. And I've been sensing God lay this theme on my heart. This is something that we'd love to see each of us in New City grow in, being real disciples in a real world. And the passage we're looking at this morning gives us some excellent insights into the process of discipleship. What does it really look like? What are we supposed to do? What does discipleship really mean? Other than coming to church on Sunday or being part of, part of a group, a, a, a small group. And so, allow me to read that passage once again for us. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. How is discipleship happening in your life? Could I invite you just for a moment to pause? How, how in your view, how, according to you, is discipleship 
happening in each of our lives? What is our plan for discipleship? I mean, if you look back at the last year or, or, or the year ahead, what plans do we have? Or last year, what, what intentionality did we have in growing as disciples of Christ Jesus? And if I were to be honest with, if we, we have to be honest with ourselves, most of us uh, functionally and, 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 and in daily reality, the best way we can describe how we are experiencing discipleship is just by the word drifting. We drift through life, hoping somewhere along the line we would become better disciples or we would grow as disciples of Christ. Uh, we come to church, that's, that's beautiful. Sometimes we, we, we read the Bible, we, we, we pray, we do all of that. But we also get sucked into the busyness of life, our work, our studies. We're busy most of the time and, and we struggle with the many challenges of being in a city like Mumbai. And we look back and, and somewhere we're hoping discipleship is, is happening. Uh, if we were to be honest, we've got to admit to ourselves that discipleship it's unintentional. It's almost happenstance. We're all drifting and we're hoping we're growing as disciples in our drifting. We don't really reflect on it, on how we're growing as disciples. We don't pray enough about it. We don't work towards it. And when was the last time any of us measured for ourselves how we have grown as disciples of Christ Jesus? You know, in, in, in New City, there's this an extremely popular dietitian. She's not part of New City, but, you know, given the number of people who are kind of uh, seeing her, I do hope at some point of time she'll become a believer and come in. <laughs> you know, so many of us. You know, she has a very simple tool. The first time I heard this, that kind of, I kind of freaked out a little bit. Uh, her very, whoever goes and sees her, the first thing she tells is, first thing in the morning, I want you to send me your weight. Every single day. Every single day. And most of us who have gone to her have been very intentional. We've measured our weight every single day and we send her an SMS, first thing, WhatsApp message, first thing in the morning, giving our weight. See, that's being intentional in tracking our progress. And that's a good thing. But how, what intentionality have, have we shown in, in tracking how much we have grown as disciples? And so, so I have to say that we, we, we just drift. And, and please don't think I'm preaching to you. I'm preaching to myself as well. I, I know exactly which areas in my discipleship that I'm just drifting. One of the most crucial areas of discipleship is being out there on mission. You know, intentionally loving people who do not yet know Jesus, growing in our friendship with them and through their life, through our lives and through our words, help them see the beauty of Jesus. And as I look into my own life, I, I realize I have no strategy, I have no intentionality for mission. I, I just drift somewhere hoping I'll meet someone and have a conversation. There's no plan, there's no intentionality in how I am being on mission. And I see for myself how I am drifting in my own discipleship. But the picture of discipleship that the passage we're looking at this morning from the book of Romans is the exact opposite of drifting. The passage we read, what do you, what do you think is the one word or the one image or the one portrait of discipleship that this passage is inviting us to see? The one word, the one imagery this passage is giving us is that discipleship is a battle. Discipleship is a battle. Verse 1, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Isn't this a battle? Isn't living our lives as living sacrifice, isn't that, isn't, isn't that a battle? Does sacrifice come naturally to us? Not at all. Or verse 2, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Isn't this a battle? Not giving into the way the world operates, but continuing to live the upside down lives that the gospel empowers us to live. To not grab at everything we can find, but rather to give as Christ taught us to. Does this come naturally to us? 
growing in this is, is a daily battle. So discipleship is a daily battle. Discipleship is a daily battle and we need to stop living as if it is not. You see, if we are drifting, we are not. Nobody drifts into a battle. And there's one very simple truth about any battle. You can't drift into a battle. We've got to be intentional in the way we move into battle. And so, I'd like to quickly unpack three things for us from this passage. First, discipleship is an external battle. Second, discipleship is an internal battle. Third, the power for discipleship and a tool for growth. Discipleship is an external battle. Discipleship is an internal battle. The power for discipleship and a tool for growth. Let's start with the first thing. Discipleship is an external battle. Verse 2, do not be confirmed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. I think this, this, the Bible is kind of very intentional in, in inviting us to see the contrast between these two words. Do not be conformed, but be transformed. It is very easy to be conformed. We don't need to put in any effort. We just have to drift and we will be confirmed. But in order to be transformed, we must fight a battle in the grace of God. We can drift and, and, and just be passive and the outcome will never be in any doubt. We will be confirmed to the culture that we are living in. But to be transformed, we need to be active. We need to be intentional. And here's the thing. You know, the reality of the pulls and pressures of Mumbai, given the reality of the pulls and pressures of Mumbai, there is no middle ground. Either we are conformed or we are transformed. There is no third way. There is no middle ground. If we are not being transformed intentionally, we are going to be conformed. At the end of every single day of our lives in Mumbai, we have changed in one of those two directions to a small degree. Either we have conformed more to the pattern of the world to a small degree at the end of every 24 hours, or we have been transformed into the image and likeness of Christ Jesus to a small degree. And as life goes on, these degrees add up shaping us to be the people we are. So when we go to bed every night, I think it will be extremely helpful for us to kind of take a moment to reflect on, have I been more confirmed to the pattern of the world today? Or have I been more transformed like Jesus today? If we are not intentionally asking ourselves this question, what do you think the outcome is going to be? There's no doubt about what the outcome is going to be. We are all going to be confirmed. I'm reminded of an illustration of a, of a frog. Um, you know, if you put a frog in a pan of water and, and boil it ever so gently, increasing the temperature of the water bit by bit, bit by bit, very slowly, very gradually, not, not sharp increases in temperature, but a very, very gradual increase in temperature, the frog is going to boil to death without ever realizing it. Because it's happened so gradually, it doesn't realize you know, that, that when the water starts boiling, that's come to a boiling depth and, and it's going to die. Every one of us are living in the boiling pot, boiling pot of Mumbai. Temperature is going up ever so gradually. Life is not getting any easier. You know it. You know, you think as a student, uh, you know, when you start working, life's going to get easier. You don't have to study so much. You don't have to do all of that. No, no, when you start work, get, you know, start working, life only gets harder. The temperature is constantly going up. The world is constantly trying to get us to conform. That's the first thing I want to draw out for us. Discipleship is an external battle. 
The second thing this passage is inviting us to see is that discipleship is an internal battle. Verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Our bodies are a battlefield. We're called to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. I don't think our bodies enjoy this idea of being a living sacrifice. All of us, we have sinful, fleshly appetites, and all of us who are followers of Christ, we also have godly, Christ-like appetites. And so discipleship is the internal battle between our sinful and fleshly appetites and our good and godly appetites that we all have in Christ Jesus. I, I do need to clarify one thing here. Bodily appetites in themselves are, are not bad. Our appetites are to taste good food, our, our appetites to experience intimacy and sex within marriage, our appetite for love and belonging, our appetites to be good at work, none of these are bad. They were all created by God as good gifts for us to enjoy. So to become more and more like Jesus' discipleship, we need not kill these appetites. That's not what discipleship is about. Discipleship is about. That's not what this internal battle is all about. God has given all of these good appetites for our enjoyment. Enjoying all of these good gifts from God is it, it's good. It's beautiful. But indulging in any of them is what is bad. In our culture, there's a very thin line between enjoyment of something and indulging in something. You know, watching a good movie or, or an episode or, or two in a series is enjoying something. And that's a good gift from God. Binge watching 13 episodes on the trot is, is indulgence. I mean, if this hits home, it's because it's near to my heart. I have to confess that I'm occasional, uh, occasionally guilty and even recently guilty of this. We, we, all, we do tend to, to, to f forget this, this line, this difference between enjoying something God has given us and indulging in it. To, so therefore, to offer our bodies as living sacrifices does not mean we cannot enjoy something, but being good disciples of Jesus means we will not indulge in anything. Do you know what's the opposite of self-sacrifice, as, as this, by, this passage is calling us to? It's self-indulgence. Our culture is constantly discipling us to say, you worth it. You earned it. You worked so hard so you can indulge. Our culture is constantly making us believe it's all about ourselves. And, and that's the battle, the external battle and the internal battle. We must be aware that we are in the midst of this battle. If we are not aware, we're not going to be really growing as disciples of Christ. And that brings us to the third and the last thing I wanted to draw out for us from this passage. The power for discipleship and a tool for growth. I'll close with some thoughts on how to find the power for discipleship. Where do we find the power to be intentional about our discipleship? But before that, I want to take a minute to introduce a very simple tool that I'm hoping we can all grow in and use as, as a church. The first thing I want to do before I introduce this tool, uh, I'd like to kind of just give us a picture, a, a visual illustration of what discipleship looks like. Uh, we first began to look at this portrait of a disciple uh, from the very first service in, of January 2022. That's when we introduced this picture and we've been reflecting on it again and again. I want to take a minute to reflect on it one more time, even for those of us who've seen it before and those of us who are seeing it for the first time. If you see that, it's there on the screen as well. If you have a card next to you, um, feel free to keep a copy with you. There are three components of discipleship. The first component is what is at the heart of it all. We call that renewal. 
renewal is being renewed in God's word, by God's spirit, in the midst of God's people. We believe that for genuine, lasting, sustainable gospel renewal to happen, all three things have to be in place. God's word, God's spirit, God's people. That's the first piece. The second piece is what we call mission or engagement. Any kind of interaction, any kind of engagement we have outside of our family and outside of the church, that's mission. And, and our work, uh, whichever industry we may be working in, not just in terms of sharing the gospel with people in our, with, with people in our workplace, but also just working to, as part of God's redemption plan for all of creation, that's mission. So we do that also intentionally as disciples of Christ. That's the second piece of discipleship. The third piece of discipleship is what we call the flux. Again, this is a word we've been reflecting on from, from last year. The flux is any place of discomfort that we are experiencing as followers of Christ. The flux is any place of of uncertainty, any place of fear, any place of doubt, any place of temptation, any place of challenge. And it is in the flux that we are either conformed to the world or transformed. This battle that we've been talking about, the battle of discipleship, is most fierce in the space of the flux. And every one of us, we experience flux in some form or the other, pretty much every single day in our lives. Let me kind of take a moment to help us really think through this flux, which I, which I really believe uh, is an extremely important aspect of, of discipleship. If we are indeed being renewed, and if we are indeed on mission, engaging with the world, we will experience flux. Now, if you're only experiencing renewal, but if we are not connecting with the world, if we're kind of hiding inside the church, and the, our only friends are in our small groups, our only friends are in church, so we only experience renewal, and we are afraid of the world, we won't go into the world, we won't touch the world, we will not experience flux. Because there's no connection with, with the challenges on the outside. On the other hand, the opposite, which is also true, if we are only engaging with the world and we are not experiencing any renewal whatsoever and we, we, we love the world, we love our career, we love all of that, but we just don't have any time or to be honest, interest, the affections of our heart are not at all in, 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 in being renewed in God's word, God's people, God's, God's spirit, then too, we will not experience any flux at all. There are going to be no tensions because you're going to have become one with the world. It is only when we are being renewed in God's word and when we are engaging with the world, that's when the flux is going to happen. That's when we're going to face real tensions as disciples of Christ. And that's the flux and that's where we're going to be either confirmed to the pattern of the world or we're going to be transformed more and more like Jesus. So that's the portrait of discipleship. Three things we must consider. Three aspects of discipleship we must consider. With that, allow me to just share a very simple tool. On, on, on the back side of this sheet that you have on your, on your chairs are just a few questions. L let me run through them. Y you know, we have talked about intentionality, having a plan, measuring how we're doing as disciples, being intentional about it. I think this can be a very simple tool. This is not rocket science. I mean, you don't like these questions, drop them. You don't like these questions, throw them away. Come up with questions of your own that you think is more relevant. That's all right. But let's start this. As a, let's use this as a starting point. You know, once in a week, what if you had to sit down and just reflect on the question, how did I experience renewal this week? What impacted me through my reading of the Bible this week. Um, you know, again, when I was reflecting and putting these questions, I was personally convicted. You know, most of us, many of us are part of a WhatsApp group called uh, Seeing Jesus Together, a community Bible reading. We are reading the same passages of the Bible, sharing with one another. 
And as I put down this question, I, I knew that even though I'm reading the Bible daily and praying and meditating on the Bible daily, I'm not really taking stock once a week or once a fortnight in terms of what is the sum substance of what God is trying to teach me from his word this week or this fortnight. I'm just too busy for that. And I was personally convicted. What is God's Holy Spirit laying on my heart? The Spirit whispers to us gently, softly. And we are all very likely, very vulnerable to snuff out what the Spirit is trying, to, God's Holy Spirit is trying to speak to us. How did gospel community, all of us coming together like this on Sunday or during the middle of the week, how did it encourage me and how did it challenge me to growth? Flux. What flux did I experience this week? What was it that caused you the most anxiety? What is it that caused you the most fear? What were you most worrying about? What were you most afraid about? That's the flux. So what is the flux? And so in this time of reflection, we are sitting and we are facing the flux rather than running into binge watching Netflix so we can forget about this problem that is there on, on our hand. The second question, how, do I, how did I respond to this? And was that response good? Or was that response a response of faith? Or was that response a response of fear? And lastly, how can I preach the gospel to myself in this flux? How can I remember what, who Jesus is and what he did for us and in that find strength to face the flux? And third, mission. What missional opportunity did God open up for me this week? Who are the people who do not know Jesus that somehow in God's sovereign plan you had a meaningful engagement with? A colleague, perhaps. Uh, you know, it's impossible for us to share the good news or, or even pray, pray for everyone we meet during a week. It's impossible. But sometimes, quite often, there is one person or two with whom we have deep, meaningful engagement. Is God inviting us to pray for that person? Is God inviting us to build our friendship with that person? Invest in growing in our friendship with that person. And how can I faithfully follow up on this? And there's a third question I added uh, on work. Uh, what has been my work? Have I worked this week at, at, at our home or at a career, wherever God's placed? And have I worked for the glory of God and the service of others? Or has my work been all about myself? Very simple tool. These questions will change. I mean, if you have better questions, let me know. We'll be happy to kind of change those questions. Um, but what if we have a tool like this that we can occasionally go to? So I want to invite us as a church on this Wednesday, I think it's a holiday, at 9 p.m., uh, I'll send out a Zoom link. It'll be great if all of us meet together on Zoom. I'm suggesting Zoom because you can avoid travel and most of us can, will be able to join. We'll meet together as a group and then we'll, we'll go into breakout rooms of two or three people each um, and we can reflect on this with one another. If, if you feel God birthing in your heart a desire to grow and being intentional about your growth as discipleship, would you sign up for that? 9 p.m. to 10 p.m. We'll meet together for 10 minutes. We'll grow, go out into breakout rooms, two people together, and each person sharing. We're not going to advise one another on this, but we're just going to share our hearts with one another. And in doing that, uh, acknowledge where we are, re where we really stand. So I'll, I'll share more details on, on the WhatsApp group. If you're not part of the WhatsApp group, let me know. We'll be happy to uh, add you to that. Why do we need these questions? Why do we need to reflect on things intentionally? Why do we need to go back and be intentional about it? The, the answer lies in what people in the airline industry call uh, the one in 60 rule. If you're familiar with navigation, if you're a pilot, or if you're familiar with navigation, you, you, you probably know what this is. The one in 60 rule. Imagine an aircraft going from point A to point B. And point A is the, is the origin and point B is the destination. As the aircraft goes from point A to point B, it starts off one degree of course. I mean, if you remember geometry lessons, you remember this device called the protractor. You know how much is one degree, right? 
It's like so much. If the, if the aircraft at the point of origin starts of one degree off course, it's going to be one mile off the destination, away from the destination for every 60 miles traveled. So start, you start at point A, you travel for 60 miles, and you're one degree off course, you're going to end up one mile away from your destination. Now imagine a plane, uh, an aircraft going around the equator. Right? It starts off, it's a, the goal is to stay on the equator, but it goes of one degree off the course. It drifts one degree off course. It circles the earth. When it comes back to the starting point, it's going to be 500 miles away from the equator. Life is a marathon. Imagine running a marathon off course and discovering at the end of a marathon that you're 100 miles away from the original destination. What a waste. How much effort wasted. The reality is, none of us, none of us are ever going to stay on track. Not one of us. And I can assure you, I'm, I'm the first one going off track. We are not going to be able to stay the course. And because we know we're going to drift away, we need to be intentional to make sure we correct our course when we drift away. And that's why we need some kind of tool. Maybe this tool will last us six months. Great. Maybe we'll get another tool. Doesn't matter. Maybe you'll come up with your own tool. Praise God. But we need to have intentionality in making sure that we are staying the track, staying on the course. I, I shudder to think. Uh, imagine running, you know, I remember as a child, uh, I was in a school sports event, and I was struggling with my eyesight, and I discovered that only a couple of months ago, and I had to start wearing glasses, and uh, it was a 200-meter race, and I was all excited as a kid. I really wanted to participate. I really wanted to win, and the 200-meter race goes like a, a circle. In those days, they put a chalk course, and you have to run on the course. The whistle blew, and I ran, and I ran, and I found no one beside me. And I realized it was not because I was ahead. It is, it is, I realized I was following another course altogether. Everybody running the 200 meter had turned the circle and they were running like that. And I was running on the 100 meter track, which is straight up. What a waste. What a waste. So we need a tool like this. And that comes us, brings us to the last thing that I want to close. You know, a tool is not going to give us the power to change. This is not the gospel. And I want to close with the power to be intentional in growing as disciples. Where are we going to get this power? Tools are good. They're helpful. They have their place. But we mustn't turn the tool into the gospel. It's just a tool. Where are we going to find the power? What's going to change the effect? affections of our heart? What's going to change the desires of our heart that deep within we're going to long to grow as disciples of Christ? That's what we're talking about here. And the answer is right here in the short passage we're looking at today. I appeal to you therefore brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. The power of to present our bodies, the power to grow as discipleship is by the mercies of God. Empowered by the mercies of God, we can grow intentionally as disciples. And the mercy of God is best demonstrated to us by the death, by the life, by the death, by the resurrection of Christ Jesus on the cross. Jesus, the Son of God, even though he was absolutely sinless and perfect in every way, he was punished by God with death on the cross. He was not punished for his sins, but he was punished for our sins, your sins and mine. God, in his great mercy, gave us his Son as a sacrifice of atonement for all of our sins. And we receive the mercy of God through the death 
and the resurrection of Christ Jesus. And it is by the mercy of God that we find. It is the mercy of God. It is Christ dying on the cross that moves our hearts, that brings us to a place that we want to be devoted to him as he is devoted to us. This is so simple, and yet we fail to understand this. Is the mercy of God available to us at all times? Yes, it is. Does God ever withdraw the mercy that he has offered to us in Christ? Never. And so, if the mercy of God is always present and available to us, why is it that in seasons, many seasons of our lives, we are not growing as disciples? Why is it we are not growing as disciples? Imagine a cold winter, not the Mumbai winter, you know, the cold Alaskan winter. Imagine that. And imagine a man has been lost in the forest. He has been lost in the cold forest. And he is freezing. And as he is desperate, he sees a fire that has been lit, that has been lit about 50 meters away. He sees the fire. He is, he is happy that he has seen the fire. And he moves on in the journey. Is that man going to be warm? No. He has seen the fire. You can get the next slide. He has seen the fire, but he has not warmed himself in the fire. He has seen it. He knows he needs it, needs it but he has not warmed himself in the fire. Similarly, many of us, we have seen the mercy of God in Christ Jesus. We know the mercy of God in Christ Jesus, but we have not warmed our hearts in the fire of the gospel. We know Jesus. We see him maybe once a week on Sundays or maybe more often in, in, in the week. But we are just too busy. We are sadly sometimes even indifferent to warm our hearts in the gospel. We know we are cold. We know the fire is there. We know the fire will make us warm. But we are just content with just that knowledge. And we don't move towards the fire to warm ourselves in the fire. We know the gospel. We know the good news of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. We know that the gospel is powerful enough to transform every one of us. But we are too busy to dwell in the gospel. And so, in closing, let me just say this. We don't have to light the fire of the gospel. God is so absolutely committed to our transformation that God is lighting fires of the gospel in every one of our, in our lives. Not once, not twice, all through our lives, God is intentionally and, and lovingly lighting these fires. Here's a thought I want to close in. When you, see God alight, when you see God light a fire of the gospel, let's move towards it. What do I mean, fire of the gospel? It could be a Sunday morning. It could be maybe something in the worship that really warmed your heart. Stay with it. Let's not just come, just take a sip and just move away. Let's stay with it. Maybe it's something in the sermon that really gripped your heart. Stay with that thought. Stay by the fire. Let's not be in a hurry to move away from the fire. Or maybe it's something you read during your personal Bible reading. Or maybe you read something and shared something. And somebody else shared something. And that really moved your heart. That really warmed your heart. Stay with it. Let's not look at the fire of the gospel the way we look at Instagram. Just scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Mindlessly scrolling. I think we need to be in the moment. And, and that's a very simple thought I want to close in. God is lighting fires of the gospel in every one of our lives. When we see God light a fire, could we stay in it? Could we remain? Could we dwell in the gospel? Let us pray. Father, we worship you, Lord. Lord, this morning we want to come 
um, in repentance for our busyness. We want to come in repentance for our indifference. Uh, we want to come in repentance, Lord, for uh, just having a sip and getting on with our lives. Uh, make us people who dwell. Uh, may we not be people who are mindlessly chasing, mindlessly running around in circles, but uh, may we be people who dwell in the gospel. Help us, Lord, every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.